going on, everyone? And thanks for joining me for another great conversation. As always, I appreciate you guys. My next guest has a ton of heart for his age, and he's back here in his hometown of Worcester to be able to shoot a documentary for one of the better stories that's here in town. He's scrappy, he's young, smart, he's a creative, he understands the struggle of the creative, and I have huge respects for him after having this talk with him. I introduce to you guys the young guy with the big heart, Fernando Ponce. Hello. Oh, that's the phone, you hear it? <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the static from the phone. But anyways, one, that's two. That's cool, it does that. Yeah, yeah one, two, and three. <laughs> Fernando, thanks for joining us, brother. What's up? Yeah, we jump right in. I appreciate your time. Um, that noise is what I believe to be, um, if you don't mind just moving the water bottle if it's in the yeah. shot. But <laughs> what that noise is, is I guess the data coming through the antenna. So the data is just coming on the glass and then just coming right up? No, going through the phone. So from the air into the phone. But the microphone somehow captures that coming in. That's crazy. Yeah, so you just went and refreshed Instagram. It needed to fetch data. So you literally were hearing the data coming into your phone. What? Yeah. <laughs> that was like, yeah, that's yeah. wild. That's what it is. So whenever you hear that, move your phone away from the microphone. The microphone is... Does that go through our bodies? Like, when we... I think that is an argument. And I don't know, you remember when COVID started, people were talking about, um, like, 5G... And how that whole thing was like a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what they meant. They meant that these 5G forces, these powers, these invisible waves were basically doing damage to our bodies. And they were going to give us like these sicknesses and these... I don't know if it's true. Depends on what you believe. Apparently, my friend has um, these like golden... They're like pyramids, right? So yep. they're like little sculptures. And at the tip, it has like 14 karat gold, I think, or 10 karat gold. Okay. And they're, it's apparently, it's used to like deflect 5G. And some people like have like a little magnet like this on my phone. Yeah. And it's like the 14K. So it like re reflects the 5G from you. So like, that's really if cool. you're next to your phone, it like won't radiate with you. Well, you see how paranoid people are about 5G? They're building totally. businesses. Yeah. About it. Yeah, yeah. That, I've never heard of that. That's really cool. And they're really making a 5G push. Like I think within the last year, yeah. they were able to do a lot more like well, building for that. My iPhone has 5G. Right. And the reason I quote the 5G is because, um, you know, I, I think they never really give you the technology before it comes out. So what I mean by that is, remember when 4G came out? Yeah. It was just 4G, right? But it really wasn't that good. And then they came out with 4G LTE. And the LTE, I think, is when they figured out, like, oh, we finally got real 4G and we're going to give it to you and just call it something different so you can pay more. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think this is the same thing. I think 5G right now is really 4G LTE until they can get 5G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they're going to call it... Well, that's why I was saying there was a push, because I've noticed, like, more of, a, like, an establishing of the 5G. I was like, wait, yeah. I thought I had 5G for a second. Yeah, nah. I, like, I have it on my phone, but I can't really tell you it does anything. Like, it's supposed to just get stuff to your phone faster. Faster data, faster speeds. Do you notice the speeds difference? I don't think so. No? But at the same time, I heard somebody say the good argument of the reason you can't is because you're still using apps that were designed for 4G. Oh, so okay. Facebook only needs 4G, so nothing different happens. You don't get your information any faster. But when they optimize their apps for 5G, then now these apps are supposed to be blazing fast. They'll probably maybe pre-catch, so like the photos will show up before it even loads type deal. Wow. Yeah, so we'll get to that level. And I've heard like 5G is more for like, imagine like going to see the Boston Celtics. Mm -hmm. And you go into the arena, and that arena, I don't know the exact number, but let's say it holds 30,000 people. Yeah. I, have you ever been in an area with a cell phone with like 15 people? It sucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You guys got to split the tower and split the data so slow. So 5G is supposed to address a lot of people in one place doing the same thing in one time. So the bandwidth for 5G is supposed to allow you to be at a concert and be able to like buy, you know, drinks and popcorn or whatever you want to buy from your phone from the concession stand and allow everybody else to do that. And, the, you know, the, the, the garden. Yep the staff will be able to get that information fast and be able to bring out popcorn and do a bunch of crazy stuff. There's a bunch of crazy wow. stuff going on. That is, that's some good I'm into knowledge. That stuff. On it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's a cool thing because, I mean, we do a lot, I do a lot of video work, so right. sometimes you have to be, like, watching these 4K resolution videos, and it's usually sometimes okay if you have good internet, but it, once you have bad internet, it's like, you have to reduce it back to, like, 720p, you know? Yeah. Whereas you could be watching it completely in 4K somewhere, like, for really good. So I couldn't imagine now with 6K cameras coming out, Oof. like, there, there's just going to be more streaming online. Yeah, yeah. So that's really cool. So 5G is supposed to do that. And speaking of video streaming, um, another example that I heard for 5G is, I guess a surgeon could technically be live-streamed into a surgery room. What? And be able to, I mean, be able to either consult, like, the people in the room, 
or be able to, with these robots and stuff like that, be able to um, control the robot from a distance with fast speeds with no lag, no delay. Whoa. That's what 5G is supposed to be eventually. That's incredible to me. I work in a hospital in, in an operating room, and I've never seen it used, but there is a robot in, in, in the hospital, and they use it for certain cases. Whoa. And this thing has arms, and all the surgeon has to do is basically just... Are they like real fingers where people are just like... They're more like hooks and claws. Whoa. Like like robot arms. Like, it's a robot, yeah, literally. It's a, but it's like a game. Have you ever played that surgeon game on the phone? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But with higher stakes. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but yeah, they, 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 they literally can do the procedure with like buttons and controls. So imagine somebody, uh, uh, like a really, really good surgeon in Europe being able to treat a person here in Massachusetts yeah. by using 5G and being able to control that machine from a distance and video stream into the room. That's wild. You can't do that right now, supposedly, with 4G, but 5G is supposed to allow that. Mm -hmm. So the reason we even got on this 5G tangent is because how paranoid people are with 5G. As I still have it on the thing. <laughs> this feedback is just like... It's sitting right here. I mean, I'm not one of the guys, like, that falls asleep with their phones, like, near their heads and stuff like that, like, or near, near my body. Like, I'm very disciplined, and I plug my phone, and I do all that. Um, but even if I don't if I don't get 5G waves, I'm still getting 4G waves. I'm still getting microwaves. I'm still getting radiation to a certain sense. You know, yeah. Like sometimes I feel us as people try to combat a lot of things that we know we can't beat and try to be picky about it. I heard something really funny about today. Um, and somebody I hope nobody's offended by this, but somebody was like, shout out to the um, to the to the Christians that basically had sex before marriage, but won't eat meat on Good Friday. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, so it's like, that, I don't mean that to diss anybody. What I mean that is to point the irony in And we just passed Good Friday. <laughs> That's what I mean, right? But the irony to me is is that, like, we're like that. Like, we won't do certain things and then try to, like, say other things are weird. And it's like, no, but the other thing you're not doing is also weird. Uh, but that's a long thing. Fernando, before we keep digging deeper and deeper, <laughs> please let the listeners know about you. I'm super excited that you answered uh, when I reached out to you uh, because I looked through your work and not only are you well-traveled, but you have... Beautiful work and, and an extensive resume. Um, so I'm glad you reached back out. But you're here, man. So please let the listeners know about you, a little bit about yourself. Oh, man. Seems like a lot. That's fine, man. You can make it long. You can condense it. Just let them know who you are, what you do, uh, and, and what you're excited to do. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm from Worcester, Massachusetts. I grew up here um, in three different neighborhoods. Kind of started in Maine South. Uh, really cool community there. A lot of I went to this school called Canterbury, like way back. Like that's real way back. Shout out to Canterbury. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then after kind of then went through there and then I went out of district for high school, went to this Doherty. So I was supposed to go to South, but but like normally where I would have gone, but I decided yeah. to do this engineering program. So here I am, this engineering focused like student going into high school. I ended up about to, so when I was gonna go for colleges, I was like, oh, let me just do this engineer route, right? I don't know why I had it in my head. I wanted to just that was my goal, and I was, like, going to that. Yeah. Uh, and then after I applied to some schools, I got into, I was going to go to the school called Wentworth in Brighton, Boston. Yep. And then from there, I also, I, I was talking to my friend. We were like, yo, we should both apply to, like, Hawaii, like, just as a school there, like, on the <laughs> list. And we had, like, one or two free more, like, applications because yeah. they usually give you out, like, a free, like, a couple applications for free. Sure. So I was like, all right, like, let me do this. We we both did it. And then I was like, yo, a couple of weeks went forward. And then I was like, yo, I got a letter back. And the letter says I got accepted. And not only was <laughs> it accepted, and I asked my friend, I was like, did you get accepted too? So he, was, he said yes too. So the Hawaii one? Yeah. Oh, man. So we were both like, yo, so like, that sounds kind of nice. And then I looked into <laughs> it. I'm like re researching on the school. It just says like waterfront lofts. Like you're in the ocean, like outside of the ocean. And yeah. you have the mountain on the other side. And it's yeah. like. This, it was like they there were new lofts almost. So I was like, oh, this sounds nice. Like, yeah. But I was like, wait a sec, Fern. Like, can I even afford any of this? I was about to ask. Is I this think like that's grants? the funnier thing. I was like, I can Can I even like afford just going to all this? Because it sounds extravagant, right? Sure. Um. So I was just kind of going with it, and then kind of after just applying and getting like a few scholarships because I was like, they didn't have an engineering program, so I guess that was like the biggest issue. Okay. I was like, all right, so I can go there and go to another one. Yeah. And I decided I, at some point, I was like, yo, like, I think I should just do the Hawaii one. I, no, no, sorry. I was going to, yeah, you might have to cut this. So I was. No, nah, it's cool, man. <laughs> this is an awesome story. I'm not cutting any of this. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. I, I think, um, so right after high school, it was like I was going to apply. I was going into Wentworth. Okay. And when I was going, so yeah, I went kind of back a little bit. That's fine, man. But when yeah. I was going um, into Wentworth, 
I realized that the school that I was trying to go to was completely just engineering focused right in Boston. Uh, and then afterwards, I, I just like completely was applied and I like paid the tuition or whatever, like the, not the tuition. I paid the deposit to like go basically. To attend, okay. And then my, I, I made some friends on this group called, um, what is it called? Quad. So it was like this app where you just connect with a bunch of different like yeah. s- students that are also going to go to the school. Yeah. So I met a bunch of these people from like the East Coast, somewhere up in Maine, somewhere in New Jersey. Like, yeah. So everyone in these group chats was coming from the East Coast. Yep to the school on the like pacific ocean so yeah it was like almost like meeting a bunch of people that are near me that are also about to do this like big leap yeah and go into like some completely far <laughs> school that they don't know like i had no family out there i have no like yeah. um it, there was just no ties with me and then when i finally ended up backing out of wentworth and going right into hawaii again yeah i i just went in with the limb and i didn't really think of like financial stuff at the moment i was like kind of just like went by my head and just went for it and then Obviously, it was a surprise for a lot of people here because they were like, we thought you were going to be in Boston. Like, yeah, we did yeah. not think you were going to be all the way. Well, that's my thing is so you could have easily picked the school, it sounds like. Yeah. Right? There was a bunch of them. Something inside of you said, I'm going to pick the the most upside down example that life has presented to me because I'm going to tell you what, you may think it's normal <laughs> to say, hey, I'm just going to go to Hawaii. That's not normal. It takes a lot of boldness to do that. So did you skip through that decision or did you maul it over? Like, did it take like a week to say, hey, you're going to Hawaii? Or did you like right away was like, you know what? This is the one. Um, I think it was what it was is that I made these friends, on, like these friends on this app, right? right. They're all going to do it. And then when I said I was backing out, I was kind of like, yo, like I have all the, I made all these bonds too that everyone thought I was going to be going to. And yeah. like, I just felt like I was kind of like either, like these friends that I had already made, I was like, I felt like I was letting them down at the moment. So it was more like, all right, so like, I feel like it's something bold and that's something that they're all going to make this decision. So, like, if they're my friends and they're about to do something crazy. Like, why wouldn't I join them on this, like, journey that they're about to go on? Because, like, obviously I'd be on the same journey. Yeah. So I ended up following it and I just, like, went with my intuition. And then I met a bunch of amazing, like, people from, like, when we first got there. Like, it was weird going somewhere you never knew anyone, but you knew people there. You knew them from, like, these apps or you knew them from... You kind of met them. Just online, I guess, socially. And after that, Met them, I ended up having the like best year of my life, and then I had to just come back because it was like one year. Like, I was like, wait, I can I even afford it? Like a four year college, like right. like that, like at the moment, like, yeah. Because I, I mean, my parents both immigrated to this country when they when I was like, I mean, before I was even born. What yeah, am I saying? Yeah. So it was what like, what nationality are your parents? My parents are El Salvadorian. Gotcha. So they they come from little sliver like Central America, and, and then they just came out here because either war or just family moving out and my mom first moved out to los angeles yeah and then my dad just ended up here and my mom ended up just coming over to the east coast because there was more work nice. from la even though my grandma she's like no 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 i'm staying over here so my grandma just never decided to leave so she's still there to right now my sister actually just got back today yeah from visiting my grandma in, over LA. in la yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's funny because like my grandma has never left over there so i have like my aunts my I feel like my grandma's sisters that also live over there yeah so I have like all these family members that are in LA and I've been going back to LA like back and forth. Yeah. So there was always this sense of I want like this tropical like excursions. It's not like a big move for because for me, I was inspired by my parents being able to like make a big move because they had to. Like they didn't have any just like they were young, like probably my age. They were like, we need to just make this move because if we don't right now, we probably won't survive in these conditions because my dad had his two brothers like yeah. um in the war that like ended up passing away yeah and then he was like already made that that big leap you know yeah so for me i guess i've been moving forward with a lot of just like gut intuition and going because you know that sometimes the more uncomfortable you are i personally see that as like the more you're gonna grow yeah yeah because if you're not uncomfortable with where you are at the moment it's like you won't grow so now that i've come back to worcester after just being in hawaii and having some time like I bring that back a lot into like what I like to do and um, a lot in the community, kind of just initiating like small like community projects. Yeah. Because one thing that Hawaii has really taught me is the connection to the earth and like how our, what we like give to the earth is what it's going to like almost give back to you as in a, in a way. I love that. Yep. And the way you respect it in, in ways like that is like, that's what's going to happen, you know? Yeah. Um, 
it's it's very following and protective of the ocean of other things like i think i think what's really huge in listening to you speak about the your adventures and the way you traveled and please we're going to get more into that because i think there's a lot to be said in that especially as somebody myself whose parents came from a small little sliver island um Puerto Rico. It is a Puerto US Rico. It is a US province, but it is still a Yo, sliver. I love how my last name is Ponce, and that's like the biggest place in Puerto Rico. And guess where I was born, good sir. You were Ponce. born in Ponce? <laughs> yeah. Yo, this is the ultimate <laughs> yes, Fernando sir. Ponce podcast. Yeah. yeah, I thought about it when I saw your name immediately. That's sick. Ponce, uh, my wife and I were there a few years ago. Um, it's fantastic. I got a good friend who's on the Spotlight Coalition uh, network. Shout out to Des. Des. Uh, she's out there with her uh, um with her 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 boyfriend right now in Ponce. And uh, Puerto Rico is an incredible place. But what, what really resonates with me, with you and your stories traveled is that I'm a person that came here from Puerto Rico at the age of three and been here since. So, yeah, I've traveled. I've been to some places. I've been to Florida. I've been to Puerto Rico. I've never been to the West Coast. And I think what blows me away from just listening to you immediately is, is you're 10 years younger than I am. And you've already experienced and seen so much because you didn't stay in Worcester. And I think that's huge. And I'm glad that you hit back on your parents because you're right. My parents were similar. They had to figure it out. They had no choice. My dad still tells me about the, you know, uh, taking the bike to McDonald's to go to work for $7 an hour and all that. I understand that struggle. But you allowed it to thrust you out of Worcester and so you could experience stuff. Me, I'm still at the point where Worcester's what I know. Yep. Right? And then now that I'm a dad, right? Now that I, I'm a homeowner, now that I'm these things, it kind of feel like the anchors are still holding me down into Worcester. And it's super inspiring, man, that you were even able to go out there, right? So wh- is, there, is there one thing that you could say specifically that traveling so much has taught you or has shown you? Um, I guess I, I guess in a way of just the way of like looking at things and what really is my, by looking at things, I mean like when I'm when I'm trying to capture either either something on video or something on photo or something like capture that like literally um, just image that you're seeing in your head to share with others that can experience that. Because if I was a like younger person and I were to see these things, I'd be like, that's what the world is like. And that is, that's why we, we love going, like we love seeing those documentaries about like um, animal planet, you know, you have, you have all these beautifully done filmed, like, yeah things of life you know and and i think life is beautiful like and 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 everyone's in everyone's way of seeing it too because that's another thing too is like not the way i look at see something is the way somebody else sees something so right carrying that on so just having a better outlook of like what life at the moment is yeah. like it's really cool of um yeah. just capturing so yeah i do like that yeah so so that's what you've gotten because yeah you're right i mean i i kind of see when i've when i've gone to puerto rico and stuff my wife is like it's just beautiful the people are beautiful. The nature is beautiful. Um, you know, the, the trees are beautiful. Everything, the fruits are, are beautiful. And then you come back to, like, a city, and it's like a concrete jungle. There's not really much beautiful. Uh, I mean, you can find beauty in it. Yeah. And later on in this conversation, we're going to talk about the artists here and the beauty that's in here in the city. Uh, well, I hope we do. Uh, but it's it's not comparable to the nature, totally. to, to those things out there. So you went from Hawaii to what right after that? You did a year in Hawaii. Let, let, let's try to re, 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 yeah, re go yeah. back to the story. <laughs> It was pretty, I did a year uh, in Hawaii and then yeah. I came back here. Okay. Um, and then I found a loop because I went back to Worcester State University. Okay. Shout out, Wu State. <laughs> so there you go. Shout out, Wu State. <laughs> but um, I went to Worcester State University and then I, through there, I found a loophole to be able to study back in Hawaii. So then I ended up going back, meeting friends up that also have spent a certain amount of time. So like they was like, they had another year, you know, their okay. experience. Yeah. So they were like starting to get comfortable and like they're making homes and everything, you know, like getting more comfortable instead of like a dorm. Sure, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That. So gotcha. just seeing them in that step was really cool and engaging. And then afterwards, came back here and just finished up university. And then uh, I just kind of go back here and there from just literally saving up like any small money. It's not yeah like anything like other than that. Just me getting money to go going yeah, you know, yeah. coming back and then working some time and then going yeah. um but fortunately the work that i've been doing out here has been like for this company um it's right in downtown it's called votary films they're like right. a collective of filmmakers that make um meaningful films and i, I say meaningful because it's really like they were they were do a lot of work on like documentary focus okay. video and i think that's one of the coolest things because and they really taught me about how stories that people have like these the, the thing you were telling me about you 
coming out three years old and you know like that's your yeah. story that you're using and brings with you so like right. wherever you are in a certain time or like if you're a business owner if you're other things like what you have is a really powerful thing because not anyone in this planet <laughs> which is crazy has that similar story right um and that's another thing too is like there's storytelling is like so much in itself too and there's like it's almost like this this format of how stories work so you yeah. have like you know the beginning and middle it's like three act structure of every of like a um yeah story so and it, there's only like five of the five of those let's say in like movie telling and like yeah. film, filmmaking and um those three that they have i just lost my chain of thought <laughs> No, yeah. Well, when you're talking about his stories, and, and, and you're absolutely correct, because to me, it's like I have a marketing background. So uh, not only in that field do stories play a big part, like you said, business owners and stuff like that. But I, I think, you know, humans are storytelling engines, mm -hmm. right? Like before we had any of this stuff, before we got comfortable on social media and do this stuff, the way we were able to survive, the way we were able to thrive, to be who we needed to be, was by telling each other stories. That's how we were able to advance this far. This is actually why I'm a big proponent of podcasting, right? Why, you know, I told you, you know, openly that this video stuff is new to me. And video is fantastic. And YouTube is fantastic. And all that stuff is fantastic. I do know that video is an I think, But at the very core, I still think it's a story. It's what the person is listening to, what they can relate to. Um, and I'm with you, man. I, I think if you could highlight somebody's story or make them realize that they have a story, that's their value. And because we attach, um, you know, scarcity to value, like things that are totally. valuable to us are very scarce to us and very hard to get. It's, it's inherent that everybody that has a story has a value, which means that their worth should be more than what they could think it is. Would you agree with that in any way, shape, or form? Or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Because I feel we were talking about a little bit before we went on air about how, you know, Minorities need to figure out that we got that power, right? Minorities need to figure out that our value is the way we talk. Our value is the way we look. Our value is the food we, we eat. That is our value. It's the culture. I, I, the whole culture aspect is the most beautiful like, exactly. thing ever. I think I've, that's another thing that I've really learned about going everywhere is like, the amount of cultures that you have. And you can, you can never be so sure about one, you know? Right. You can have your thoughts and everything. And then the second you go in to step into another culture, yeah. you need to know that like, at that moment, you're respecting what, what is the norm there and what what their values that those people that you're walking around hold. So like right. just knowing that and like going to different places, like I've been over to Southeast Asia, I've done like Thailand, I've done wow. Malaysia, uh, I've done uh, a few other places. Yeah, but yeah. Bangkok, was, I saw on your profile. You were, you're yeah, in Bangkok. Thailand, yeah. Listen, yes, man. It's it, Please. Just the best place of Phuket because everyone, everyone's like, fuck it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, what, 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 once again, you are like traveling, this fearlessness, like. I, it's really just going and, and okay. it's really sacrificing a lot though like you're you're sacrificing like working like working just like on the side you know just hustling yeah. I, I, the hustle really is like you know you're just like what if what you want to do has to you have to do something to it you gotta like you gotta work for that you gotta be yeah. like really on top of what you want right? yeah because if you're not on top of yourself and you don't set up these like healthy habits yeah it won't be it, it won't it's not it just doesn't happen what i think listen where let, let me be let me be honest with you, and this is fantastic that this you're 24. You told me, yeah. Who, who mentor? Who like? What are your mentors? Who are your role models? Because you're speaking like a person that's a lot more mature than 24 years old. And I don't know if that's by accident. I don't know if it's that you have a mentor that keeps you in line and says, "Hey, man, like stop being so." But you don't hear 24 years old say stuff like that, like build healthy habits. On the contrary, the 24 year old is usually saying, "I got another six to. You know, I ain't 30 yet. Like I, I, I'll settle down when I'm 30 or I'm 40." You seem to be very geared, and once again, the stuff that you're saying comes from a person maybe my age, maybe 30, maybe, you know, whatever. What motivates you? Who, who motivates you? What yeah. is it that keeps you rolling, man? Um, that's been a tough one because for a while, I think for the past, like, I think right before COVID, so I'd say last year, okay. um, about more than a year ago, Yeah, I was kind of just like, you know, like doing everything. It's like almost like just what I did was like wake up, you know, at whatever time and just kind of did my day and went on and sometimes went out with friends, you know, like afterwards and then went back and then just I started noticing this cycle of just like really just me not putting the best in for what is like my body, you know, yeah. for like what is my health and, and other things too with like um, just kind of not focusing and like I was binge watching a bunch of like shows, you know, like, yeah, yeah. you know, just really for me, it was just 
chilling, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then I started realizing that with uh, some, like, this, I have this mentor, and he was at our job, and he was talking about how there's this, this uh, he mentioned, like, the seven habits of highly effective people. Yep. Um, really cool book because it kind of talks about things in three levels. Um, it has the first paradigm. I've mentioned this before, too, in, in um, this event we had called Interdependence. Okay. So I have this, like, collective of artists, friends, yep. that we have all, like, just teamed up. And then whenever we have some free time, we just try to create some really cool things. Dope. Um, we partner up with, like, another organization that does something similar. They're called El Salon. Um, I've heard. Yeah. I think I follow them on Instagram. Shout yeah, out yeah. to them. Hopefully to be speaking to, um, is it Vicky? Uh, Vanessa. Vanessa. I knew it was going to be. Uh, hopefully to be speaking to Vanessa soon. Shout out to her. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, um, so just forming together with these friends, we'd create events. And obviously those events take like effort and time, right? Yeah. So I had, basically I was just making more responsibilities. It's like when you have responsibilities, it's just like they can add up. And if you're not managing them right, yeah. you're going to just kind of sacrifice one. You know, you're just like, it's almost like you're you're pushing out some of the things that you could be doing. Yeah. Um, In terms of like, oh, like, I guess I'd say like being like more chill, you know, just not doing much. Right. Um, but then I started seeing if I have more responsibilities, like someone's got to do them. Um, so I just started finding ways to like make more time for it in a way of just like managing more the time that I use. So like yeah. kind of being more, I guess, on top of things in, in the sense of being just like either organized and also like the habits, like waking up. Right? Like I, I like to wake up like six o'clock yeah. <laughs> like every day. It's just here, like, it's like, it's like up and everything. Um, but for a while, I, w- I, say, I say that now because right for at the beginning of the forming a habit like this, I had to like really put myself in. I was just like 5 a.m. like going every day. Yeah. But then I was like, all right, I need to sleep though. And it's just like finding the right balance. Like now I've like found that and I'm able to just start off when I go. Yeah. Um, so really just finding, I guess, the things that work for you. And it's, it's a tough one because I There's, think it's like a really cliche thing to say, like always the consistency or stuff like that. Yeah. But once you do see like the small things being done and you're tracking this, yeah. it's like you actually start seeing what you're what you're accomplishing. And it makes you excited because then you 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 keep a trend of like small accomplishments being more and more done. Right. And then you're reaching and setting goal setting to like what you actually want. It's yeah. Like, it's and it's also just so multiplying and, and expecting the compound. Of yeah. It. yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm just blown away that a 24 year old has that operating system. And I'm, kudos to you. This is not like I'm weirded out or anything. It's just rare, is what I'm saying. At least from and maybe I'm out of touch. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to say that I know every 24 year old in the world because yeah, I yeah. don't. Um, but you know, uh, traditionally, a lot of people are not focused on routines like you are or, or improving themselves is what it sounds like. Um, and it, kudos to you because. That's what you need. I like to tell my wife a lot of times is like, you know, when we're babies, we need a lot of organization in order to function. When we're kids, we need a routine in order to function. We need to be to bed by eight o'clock. We need to do these things, right? And then you notice the kids that struggle the most are the ones that don't have the routine, right? So what makes anybody think that as we get older, that goes away? We need some type of structure because we are naturally roaming creatures. And if we allow ourselves to basically do whatever we want with our time, you already know what's going to happen. We're going to be sitting in front of that Xbox. We're going to be watching a bunch of Netflix and doing some stuff. Um, super impressive stuff. I want to go back into the work that you're doing. I don't think you've officially told the people that you do video, but you do more than video. You're telling stories out here in the city. Yeah. You have a group of collectors. Um, what, what do you guys call it again? Side Note Program. Sa- side Note Program, which I think is an awesome idea. I even read what you told me how you guys got the idea. But please... Tell the listeners about what you guys are up to, what's happening here in Worcester. Um, fortunately, with this podcast, I've been able to have awesome people from Worcester that are doing really big things here. Um, I, I had Jasmine on from the WAC. I have you on, which is fantastic. I have Maria Ravelli on, which she, she does the frozen fridges. Maria Ravelli is doing really good things. Uh, I'm happy about that. I had Ernie Floyd on, and he, he runs the, the, the local radio station. Um, so we talked about before we got on the mic, that none of the stuff we remember happening in Worcester before. Talk about your work and what you're doing in the city, please. Totally. Um, I guess lately there's we've kind of just been focusing a lot on yeah, a little bit on the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, you good, brother. Yeah, I think um about what was it? Uh, two years ago, I think we were just kind of roaming around and realizing like, what do we what do we want to do around here? Like, um, do we just want to just hang out and like kind of focus more on like, let's say I wanted to like move out somewhere. Yep. Was I focusing more on just trying to leave and go somewhere or was I actually trying to like be where I am? And that's the whole thing of like just being present and grounded almost, right? And then I started realizing, oh, like the communities maybe that are outside 
because I was part of this like organization that was called Enactus, which is like uh, us. We basically would create small programs in the city, and awesome. Um, but they the, the programs were to help the people. Like um, so, we would find needs in the community, and then we would create like tangible like projects that would actually support those people in some way. Sweet man. So when just seeing that when I was doing that, and then afterwards moving towards like two years ago is like. I was I was done with that program that I was doing that the organization that I was working with, um, still connected to them, but just like at because it was a university program. Okay. So after I, I finished that, I was like, all right, so I could keep doing this in a way like to try to scale something or target a different you know area, and then I started realizing that there's there's like a, a need. What is a need is like that there's a lack of art and a lack of just community in a sense of like younger younger like people. Sure. You know. Yeah. It kind of felt like it was always like those people were all on their own in different groups. Like no one was really forming community. Okay. Um, so I, I, I realized that what really brings a lot of people together and I've seen it from across just traveling and just seeing people how they are is like art connects a lot of people. And so it was like just, you know, good, good energy pretty much. Yeah. So yeah, right. we, what we did is we started to see like, all right, so how can we just bring a bunch of our homies together in a way that um, it's like we can create a, a safe event for everyone that's, showcasing a bunch of the people that we like know it's their art you know like how so right. we have a lot of just art we had like art showcases in a sense but then we were like all right but we can do more than this um let's try to do this like a marketplace right yeah um and we had every we had a, like because a bunch of people doing like are having small businesses now right right um so we've kind of just found like really unique and we kind of set up this event right by portland street and we did like a marketplace where people were selling like their own goods but in their own really cool way because like we had everyone was like their their section wasn't just like a table or anything. It was like everyone like kind of decked it out like their own like style, like whatever yeah. your style is. We had um, Ivory Henry there; she was painting. We had like a, a, a <laughs> few other artists that were just like there doing their thing, you know. Um, so after that, we kind of just kept doing. It was like almost like a continuation of that, but really like slow because we were just like call side note programs because like we we're all trying to focus on our what are like what we are as individuals and like our art yeah so i do filmmaking uh george anon he does photography and we also have um manny and um nelson artavia there you go so we're uh shout out to you guys yeah many pack hey see you there there you go <laughs> uh and so we all had our own art you know in a sense so we were like, all right, but what can we like here and there come and do? And like, it's side note. So like, we and we when you're talking to someone, you're saying side note. Yeah. It's just saying you have this like, it's like this other program that's going on, you know. Right. But in a sense that this is a cool thing because it's always like the side note is that side conversation. What we're really trying to aim to do is bring a lot of like the BIPOC community, you know, together and and create good things with each other, build each other, you know. Because sometimes there's a, like there's a big sense of that separation in in, yeah. in in this city. I mean, in a lot of cities too. Like you have like New oh, York, sure. Boston, like anywhere really. What's a BIPOC community? Uh, did, did, I, did I hear that right? BIPOC. Yeah, BIPOC. What's that? Please. Um, me. So it's Black Indigenous um, people of color. So oh, it's like you have okay. like a community of like basically just minorities. People. Yeah. Yeah, got gotcha, you, got gotcha. you. A so, lot of the minority community. Yeah. Okay, cool. No, nah, I'm super excited about that stuff. Yeah. I, yeah, I. I, I I've been doing a lot of work on on um and, and I've been writing a lot about you know how how a lot of a lot of everything that we've seen has been organized for us to for for have for it to happen on purpose and, and I'm not gonna go on a long tangent about it because I can go on a long tangent about <laughs> it uh, but basically where like there's no accident uh, I like to tell this story there is like when I got my first job I was doing landscaping and I was getting seven fifty an hour right I made two hundred bucks. They took, you know, after taxes, I got 145 bucks. And then in my time, I don't know about your time, in my time, Timberland boots were really big. Mm -hmm. So I got paid 140 bucks. Guess how much the Timberland boots were? 140 bucks. Really? So to me, it's like, as a kid, you don't know this stuff, but like, as I'm getting older and older, I'm starting to see this paradigm shift, um, especially where minorities were, it's like, we're given this information to serve a purpose, and that's to consume, right? That's to be able to work our asses off to be able to get this, not know our value, so they give us less value, and then we give it back uh, uh, to them because we need to buy some boots or need to buy something new, materialistic, the next Xbox game, whatever you call it, right? Uh, and, and I've been very deep into that. So I can appreciate a community of minorities getting together and making some art happen. Yeah. What I find, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is that artists are not only the most friendliest people, but the most open-minded people 
that you can very open minded for sure. Yeah. What What are your experience with some artists that you worked with? Is there any good stories that you got that you know just stick into your head that you're like, wow, this artist is doing something amazing that I didn't think could happen? Do you have any stories for that? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, I think lately it's been a lot of just surrounding myself with different forms of art. Okay. You know, I think we always think of the traditional, you know, just like pen and paper, you know, kind of deal. Sure. Um, but I've learned that, like, a lot of art can come in so many different forms. And, like, whether it's with their hands, with their eyes, with their, like, you know, it's like different piece components of you yep. to make that type of art. And it's also different mediums, you know, you have, like visual audio you know it, audio can be an art you said you're a good audio guy yeah no you, that, you, this, some, is, this can be really good for you then. somebody has told me that like this podcast is a form of art uh, and yeah I, I i just like conversations man like i, I think it's easy to get somebody to come in and, and this sounds selfish but it's not because i'm sure my listeners get this too you guests come in and charge my battery right because i get i don't get paid to do this but i get a, a payment in my soul to be able to not only give you a spotlight, but to be be inspired by you, right? That's so like, awesome. Yeah, like so. My job. I tell my wife all the time. I have the luckiest job ever, and she's like, "What do you mean?" And I'm like, "I get. I, 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 my job is to sit down and have conversations with the most interesting people ever, and learn from them again. That's a great from way of putting that. Yeah, and, and it's fantastic. And and the beauty of it is, is I'm about 83, 84 episodes in. I haven't made a single dollar from this podcast. Damn, it, damn. I didn't know. I really, when you hit me up, it was like the first time I heard of it. D yeah, and that's what I mean. I need to get more exposure, especially here in town. Um, but my thing is that is I have a very loyal following, and they've been following me from the beginning, and they respect these conversations as well because it inspires them. I mean, you're a person that, once again, I'm here in Worcester, stuck walled in, and you've pretty much traveled to the major parts of the world and have done that fearlessly. I mean, I'm talking about like, I, I, I'm trying to set a summer trip for my family this summer, and I'm already like, yo, but this could happen, that can happen, or they might not let us on the plane because of COVID vaccines and all this stuff. And, yeah. and you're just like, well, while you sit here, Jose, and trip yourself up over that BS, I'm going to go back and forth to Hawaii four times so you could keep... And, and there's something to be said about that, man. That, yeah. that, that's it's true. not just there. I think now it's come to the point where I'm like, I can go beyond that. Like, where can I go next? Like, can I go yeah. to Peru or something? You know, like... You see what I'm saying? There's, but, there's just this want, this need to, like... All right, that's like there's there's more, you know. It's like there's yeah. a lot more out there. But what it really a lot. What's funny is that that a lot. What that taught me is like, don't always have to leave. You know, you can like, you can create where you are too. Because for a while, it's like thinking there's nothing to create here, and I was like, now after building these different projects with different artists, I've just been like, whoa, like I can create my own things here. Yeah, it's almost like you just got to like surround it really and like find people that are also into that type of stuff. Yeah. And, and be able to cultivate with them. Yeah. Totally. I um podcasts are a little bit hard. They're getting more and more popular now. Uh, but I've been into podcasts uh to when it was stupid to listen to podcasts. Like I'm talking about like 2016, I was listening to podcasts and I'm a rare the guy, right? So um I could I could consume easily on a good day eight to twelve hours of podcast. That's damn. Yeah, that's can you do do you just keep it in the background? Exactly. That's why I'm not saying that I sit around for eight to twelve hours, but podcasts have Given me kind of what I, I, like audio books can give you. Have you heard Joe Rogan? I, I do listen to Joe Rogan, but ever since he signed to Spotify, I hate Spotify. And He's, I, I, I he hope signed watching. to them? Exclusivity. Oh, damn. Yeah, and I hate Spotify. They know that. I hope they're watching this. <laughs> uh, no, nah, it doesn't matter. I'm just one guy. Dude. I'm just kidding. Um, but I'm not a big fan of Spotify. Um, and so I had to sacrifice listening to Joe Rogan so that I could, uh, uh, um, you know, stick it to Spotify, basically. Have you watched any on YouTube? I, they own exclusivity, so he can't post on YouTube. He could post his clips on YouTube, but he the can't full, post the full thing on YouTube. The full episode is not allowed. That's part of his deal. It's you what? can find the full video on their app because he signed exclusivity to. Them. I was weirded out. I was on a road trip recently with one of my friends. Yeah. Um, we did like from we we went last during COVID too, like right before it got like maniac. So like yeah. I guess it was like actually it was like summer. Cool. Gotcha. So we did this cool road trip where we went all the way across. We were like. Oh damn, it's like pretty heavy right now. So we have like long drives because we were hauling. We weren't. We were trying to be on a budget, you know, just like really just go where you want to go. Yeah. But see the most. So we stayed at like eleven national parks because we just went national park, Sweet. national park, national. It's a sacrifice too because like there might be a distance between a couple that you should just get a hotel or just like sure. just stay somewhere sleep. We were like, let's just go. And then some nights, and if we didn't make it, like of driving too much, we'd just like find like we call it boondocking. <laughs> and boondocking is when you just like find a like a really like a designated, it's like almost designated, but yeah. it's just an open, like abandoned, like, r like either like there's different roads and stuff. Yeah. 
um, and you're able to just like pitch up a whole camp in the middle of nowhere <laughs> because there's no laws at that. But there's places where you can't do that because there's like a lot of laws. Right. Um, so I, I had like the setup in I had <laughs> my car. We had tents. We had you know yeah, a campfire insane. just like middle of nowhere. Some nights we heard coyotes and things, but yeah, just after doing that. Oh, where was I going with this? Because we were connecting with. Oh, so yeah, we had those long drives. Okay. Joe Rogan just had to be right on the uh, on the on the like podcast, and then I realized that they did video. I was like, oh shoot, like yeah, they have video. Yeah. So that was like that was like another entertaining. I was a big, element. I, I was a big. Uh, I, I still am a Joe Rogan fan. I think he's fantastic. He's 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 a meathead and all these other things, but he can. People have heard me say this before, but he can have a conversation with anybody. He conversates with the craziest people. But podcasting, when I first started, <laughs> I can see him like. Podcasting Jesus, yeah, no, <laughs> just he, like he would super be the guy. Casual. He'd be just casual about it. He would be the guy. You you want Jesus to go on a podcast? Bring him to the Joe Rogan podcast. He's inspired a lot of the stuff that I do, but it's bigger than just Joe Rogan. It's a whole slew uh, uh, of podcasters. And what I got from podcasts is, is you know, I'm I, I'm a dreamer. I'm an entrepreneur that's always working on things, always trying to build businesses so I could get out of my nine to five. Yep. So I maximize that time by having it in the background, like you said. So while I'm on the drive, while I'm working out. Um, while I'm at work, I'm consuming information, consuming, you know, great conversations like this one, consuming, uh, uh, um, you know, historical, I, I'm, I'm big on Stoic philosophy and Greek philosophy. So, you know, absorbing all this information when other people are basically wasting time, um, pity partying about their nine to five and living through it and being in the swamp. I'm I'm fired up. I'm in the background, like doing my job, but constantly listening to valuable information. Um, and and I owe that to podcasts, right? And, and sometimes you get fun podcasts, you get comedians, you get jokers, you get whatever. And then sometimes you get real serious podcasts, <laughs> and sometimes you get like the, the the scripted ones that are like shows. Like I don't know if you ever listened to them, but they're like a five part show where you can like listen to the whole thing, and it's really cool. I found listening um, to stories be more important because video is important. I'm not taking nothing away from video. And I have this conversation with my brother-in-law all the time. <laughs> video is very key because we need to see what it is so we can feel it. Right. But listening to a story that you can relate to, you could be blindfolded. And if you listen to that story, it's going to evoke a reaction to you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I think podcast allowed that opportunity for me to be able to listen to a lot of, you know, uh, opinions and a lot of, you know, professionals, non-professionals, and now I get to do it myself personally, and I see the benefit. It's like, look, I'm allowed to share my platform with a lot of people, and I'm allowed to highlight stories like yours, yeah. highlight stories of people coming by. And just uh, listening to people is the cool part, I think. Yeah, absolutely. The battery down there. We're out on that one. Yeah, that no worries about it, man. <laughs> uh, this is the audio. See, once again, this is the this audio This is the first. audio podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's just one of those things, man. Audio is really cool. But anyways, let's get back to, to the town of Worcester. So... What do you think changed, man? Like uh, when when I was growing up, at least I, I really wasn't aware of any of this art stuff. What do you is, do? You think COVID really had a big thing to do with it? Do you think it's just time that you know people understood their value? Why is everybody coming out the woodwork? Yeah, I, I think for what I've seen it, yeah. and a lot of people have been voicing themselves more, is because a lot in the community has been changing, and I think you probably noticed that with like the new development in Kelly Square and yeah. um, a lot of different parts of Worcester that have just started growing and growing and growing. Okay. And what it's happening is that it's reaching more and more communities, and these communities, not only is it like growing in their areas, but they're being affected, you know? Like okay. their actual resources and land is actually being taken from them, and they're giving less like resources to help them. And that's what it is on like a really small scale, I guess that I'm saying it. Yeah. But it's like a trickle of that. People are like, wait, we need to like voice ourselves a little more. We need to show our presence here because yeah. we're here, but we just aren't a community. You know, it's not like a bunch of different people. It's it, it's it's almost like with more voices that you have, more people are being able to be held like and heard, you know? Right. So I, I've noticed a lot more of that, of just more people wanting to be like, hey, we are here, you know, like these are our communities too. You know, these are our families. These are our kids. These are, right. you know, these are our, like, you know, people, but so by things growing and other development being happened, they're affected, affected. So I think that push lately with just the development that's been happening, happening in the city has really had people like, yo, like I can't just not be held like yeah. heard or something, you know? Yeah. Um. So a lot of people have been like showing their, I, I feel like art is a really good way of like sh showing your voice, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think I've done a lot lately with like, um, at the bridge, if you've heard of the bridge, um, yeah, I went you... to the little uh, the uh, Friday the event that they had to to try to raise money or whatever. I was there for a little bit. Yeah, uh, the... I just stood outside. I didn't get to go in the building, but that was my first introduction to the bridge. Yeah, 
Uh, and Jasmine, friend of the show, she even told me that that was even a thing. Uh, I live, as you know, because uh, you came here, I live on the outskirts of the city. So I, I don't live in the inner city. And I found it very interesting that um, I didn't know anything about that project. You want to talk about the project, the Save the Bridge project, just yeah, for the yeah. listeners that don't know? Of course. Yeah, I think this is a really cool thing that's happening in our community that's making almost like a movement. Yeah. You know, because um, there's this big building right on 300 South Bridge Street. Uh, it used to be an old textile mill yep. uh, run. I mean, it was regular, like, manufacturing plant, right, that you have right in the city right by this bridge. So it's like the bridge connected to the actual building that's right there. So they've, they've now they've nicknamed it because, uh, I'll explain in a sec, but they had to um, rename it to the bridge because a lot of the people there were like, oh, like it's right next to ac the actual bridge, you know? Because yeah. they're not going to call it the manufacturing plant that's not yeah. there anymore, right? <laughs> it's not catchy. <laughs> <laughs> so they, um, they this basically this um, manufacturing plant went down and then the building was um, given to one of the trust members of like the property yeah. and they've just had it held, you know, held. And then Dan Ford is one of the guys who was friends with the, one of the owners. And he was like, Oh, like, Hey, I'll just take your, um, if you need someone to like kind of watch the property, I can manage it, you know? And yeah. then after he said that they did that. So he was just like kind of monitoring, you know, the, the property for the, pretty much. Cause it was, it's, it's been broken down. It's been so many years since that manufacturing plant was yeah, open. The but inside right. it's not in, in the best conditions, you know, it's, right. it's got a lot of work that it needs yeah. to be done to it. So Dan Ford, after that, he, he was kind of running some things there, just, just trying to make sure it's maintained. And then he actually started this organization there called Crash Course Collisions. And it's basically a, this cool program where he like helps teens like, um, fix cars and rebuild them and then sell them, you know, yeah. for like, super for, dope. for them. Cause it's some of the youth are like an actual need for like money, you know, to like, obviously not, go, they need jobs pretty much, you sure, know what it is. Sure. Um, and so, they can learn the skill. Yeah. I mean, they could make their own business, their own mechanic business at some point. Yeah. And that's what, that's what the long-term plan of that program is. So he started doing that for a while. And then um, Judy Perry, she, she's another friend of Dan's. She she had this organization, um, Julie B of the Arts, and she basically is create is wants to create this program there that just has all different forms of art. You have music, you have art, you know, like right. all these different components of art, and she wants to like have a center there. And then they want to have student um like people live on the top floor. So there's this big vision of of them that they want to do that. And then now uh, lately, El Salon has really been implemented there. And El Salon is a collective of art, is not a collective of artists. It's a few, a few like artists that were just like, "Hey, we want to start having like showcases." So they started doing art showcases there, um, and then more and more people got involved because if obviously if there's an art showcase, it's got to be artists, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the artists and it's like that's been a cool scene because you've just been seeing a lot of different types of art on in in on the place. So the bridge has been the host for that for a while, you know. Um, with the bridge is the whole concept. So after I think just four three weeks ago, um, Dan got a call saying, "Hey." The bridge was been sold, so he said, "What? Like this yeah. is this is an emergency?" Because for a while it's just been like they've been doing the programs, implementing more and more. Yeah. Um, because the building was just a building, like it was an empty. No one was gonna be using right, it, you know. Right. It was a waste of land at that point. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And so th they were like, "It's it's sold." And then luckily Dan was able to get two weeks. He's like, uh, "I'm gonna give you two. I think I think the owner told Dan that he gets two weeks to like either come up with a million dollars because that's what the price that they were selling it at. Yeah. Or it was, I don't know, I think that's all he, all, all that the offer was. And we were like, oh, like we might have to see if we can maybe match him. Yep. Like the, the uh, a million dollars that the investors are going to give. Yeah. Or figure something out because like that's a big price, you know? Yeah, yeah. So they, you know what, but they, they took the risk though. I, 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 they're still working on it right now and I'll explain where you can go to help them out. Please, for sure. Because, um, they they just set it out and they set up this campaign and it literally says like, you know how it says start to zero. It said zero to to make a million dollars. I was like, wow, like that's a big go. They're about to like yeah not let us, not let a community like have this and they're really about to like either invest in like make some like condos there. For me, I was like, they're gonna make condos. Yeah. Like I was like, where <laughs> what? Yeah. Now I I don't even know if you're in a position to answer this, but from your experience, why hasn't the city of Worcester stepped in to save the day? Yeah, I, I, there's been a lot of like talk, different talks on that, and I think okay. um, that's kind of what, one of the more challenging pieces, probably too, because it's like you don't you don't really you don't really see those things because I feel like a lot of things are just not like told 
yeah. either in behind. So we don't know like what the city has already been saying about the program. So now it's just trying to find, I think, the find out like really if they can help us. And I think um Jim McGovern actually last weekend he was he was at the bridge. Was he? So yeah. He, okay. he did, apparently missed. like he a lot of people just didn't know about this what was this space that was happening. Yeah. So because it's right in the corner, it's like you don't really see this stuff happening, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. So for them, they were like a lot of people were just it's it's like a discovery point. They're like, wait, what? Like this has yeah. been, you know? Yeah. So now they're trying to I think figure out uh, a relationship like if they can form some sort sort of relationship, but. I'm still too not familiar with what's going on on that side. Right. And it is surprising that it's not well known because the diner right next to it is super well known. It's yeah, like one of the, Mrs. Wister. Yeah, it's like, one, it's like one of the cornerstones of Worcester, but yeah. nobody seems to look 10 feet over. So that Miss Wister is on the same property that's being sold. So, like, so it's going to go too. It's it's in a big risk because um, I think either the people who are investing, they, they said that she can stay. But that's kind of like also messed up. It's like, oh yeah, you can stay, <laughs> but we're taking them out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Because they're obviously going to know there's people that are there doing things. Yeah. Um. So I I think she's kind of thinking that she has a 10-year lease, I think, left. So she's still trying to get out of there. Yeah. Um, I think after the 10 years, though. But apparently they said that she might be able to stay. So she's kind of like more, like, I think she's settled into like, all right, I can settle a lease here and maybe yeah. see if in 10 years I can get that business. But I, I honestly think that that would probably not be the move because right. if she agrees to that in 10 years like what if this is still like a really good valuable thing and they just tear it out yeah you know, it's just yeah, gonna yeah. it's gonna break someone's heart in 10 years like why do something like that you know and i think the tough tough the, the tough part with the city of worcester is they're not there's no incentive to them besides donation to actually try to save this because i mean let's be honest here the people at the bridge, if I'm not mistaken, are not necessarily charging the you know the youth that go there and, and take advantage of the facility. Um, so I think the city of Worcester puts themselves in a position where it's like, how are you able to mo- monetize this? How are you able to get money back into Worcester by just helping every kid off the street? Yeah. Um, I don't I know anything about that's the big it. piece of them getting in. That's, that's right. definitely... I think that's why they stay away because to yeah. them it's like, I, I hate to say this, and this sound very, but money, money lost, right? They're like, look, we're going to put money in the bridge. We're going to lose this or whatever. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, a normal-minded person would say there's much more value in helping kids than there is in whatever price tag you can put. Yeah. But the person running the books in Worcester might think otherwise, right? Like, <laughs> like my job is to run the books Yo. and to make sure that this I don't... This is how we're running them. Yeah, right. And make sure I don't go over by a lot. So that's a tricky subject. Um, where I, but can... I think there's a lot of, like, recently with the stimulus, I think the state, that's why they were trying to get the state, I think, the yeah. more involved because I think with the money coming in a lot because of the signed... I think it's a sign package that okay. just happened. Yeah, it's there's just, a lot. There's a lot of resources, so they they could give relief. Yeah. Know? So I don't I don't know. That'd be super cool though if the if they like help save the place. They should. They should. Um, I mean, for the same reason that you would have a boys and girls club. Uh, when I was growing up, the one in Ionic was the one that I was actually uh, attending and very familiar with. So I know the power of being able. I know the power from two sides. I know the power of being youth. And being able to have a place to go, to learn, and to network, and to be with other kids your age. Yep. But I also understand a place for where the parents can trust mm-hmm. that their kids are safe and their kids can go when they're working nine to five. Because I'm sure my parents felt super safe about me being at, at Ionic, or me being at Campfire, or me being at all these services while they could focus on the work and getting food on the table. So I think if anybody in the city of Worcester is listening, and I hope I would ever get that reach. Um, you know, saving the bridge would basically give the opportunity for parents to focus on work and for kids to learn how to fix cars, for yeah. kids to learn how to do art, for kids to learn how to network, which is more important. That The biggest value in life for any child person in the world is networking. Totally. Your I think own- a lot of disconnection lately. So networking is getting even tougher for the youth. Absolutely, which is why I'm, I'm still blown away when I get somebody to respond to me and say, yeah, I'll do the podcast because of that, because yeah. a lot of people just shine away and go in, the, in their cocoons. Uh, but I want to bring these stories on because you just gave me insight into the bridge that I didn't even know before this conversation. And, and so many other things that even happened before the cameras or the microphone went on. You taught me about video. You taught me about a lot of things. This is that effect and action. We can only do oh so many things, but you can help catapult me if you can lever- and if, I, if I can leverage the information you know and the people you know, totally. vice versa. right? You can leverage the information I know and the people I know to do whatever. This is going to be completely off topic. <laughs> Uh, but you were talking about the stimulus package and the print thing. Um, I don't talk to many 24-year-olds, and I hope that doesn't sound as a diss. I'm just 34, and I feel like I'm 80. Uh, 
What do you guys know about the money printing um, and Bitcoin? Currently, I... And I know you don't speak for all 24 years. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's a tough question because yeah. it's like definitely... Well, let me ask it. you this. Are you pro money spend, uh, money printing or against money printing? I would... I mean, I'm not... I don't really have too much position in, in any of these. Okay. These like kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because I I've, I mean, lately I've found that like... Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to... I think I want to learn more about that. For, for sure. sure. Yeah, cool. No, I just wanted to ask. And, and, and because when I was 24, I didn't know either. Um, But yeah, like... No, there's people my age that, dude, they're like, they know, they know exactly what they're doing. I'm sure that I've heard of like 16 year olds now just getting into like, yeah, Bitcoin and like other smaller cryptos like Do- Doge. Doge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no Doge. I'm just a Bitcoin guy. But once again, I'm not 24 and I'm not young and I'm not hip, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the there's thing. A, I mean, the internet has a bunch of stuff going on. It's now a bunch of stuff. But they just came up with a virtual art NFTs. Have you seen NFTs that? NFTs are great. That's, How do you feel about NFTs, man? Before I'm, we go on, I mean, they. I'm all like anti against carbon footprint. I think that's yeah. why I'm kind of more like not really into the like yep. Bitcoin. Yeah. And like just other things, just like yeah, that makes a carbon footprint. Footprint for me, I'm just like ah, like why? Right, right, why right. Even bother? Um, just because I think the planet's already messed up. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I could. I mean, is obviously the more information. Well, I could connect you with individuals that can prove to you that it's actually cleaner to mine Bitcoin than it is to mine fossil fuels. Yeah, a thousand percent. I, I want to hear this discussion for yeah. sure. Oh yeah, listen, this is this is a rabbit hole, my good sir. This oh, is, I gotta hear about that. Bitcoin is a rabbit hole. Yeah, there's guys that are. I'll give you one example, and uh, I'm just. I think it's North Dakota. But if I'm wrong, it's one of those Dakotas, right? Mm-hmm. There's a gentleman out there, right? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I, I, I just forgot where. It could have been Wyoming, but I'm pretty sure it's North Dakota. So out there when they're digging for oil, um, every now and then to release the pressure in the pipes, and I could be butchering this, but I think it's what happened is they do this thing called venting where they blow out carbon into the air to release to the pipes, right? Okay. So uh, one of the Bitcoin miners basically said, hey, man, uh, oh, and if you do this too many times during the week, the state can shut you down. Because uh, it's a threat to it's a threat to the environment. Oh damn! Right. So if you're a company and you do you need to do this or you're gonna blow your pipes, and if you if you blow your pipes you're gonna lose money. But if you do that too many times, you're gonna get shut down and you're gonna lose money. So you lose either way in this yeah. situation, right? Bitcoin miners came and said, "Hey, you know what? We need power and we need raw power to mine this Bitcoin because it's all computing power, it's all electrical power, right?" Mm-hmm. So they were able to get. The vents, the pressure from the carbon from the vents that are happening, and they were able to transmit that into generators that basically converted into electricity that basically ran the mining equipment. So they got carbon wasted gas, which you're calling a footprint, converted it into electricity in order to mine Bitcoin. And it's the purest, safest, cleanest way to mine Bitcoin. And wow. there's a lot of companies that are doing stuff similar to that. Really? So not only is it safer and better to mine Bitcoin, um, it's it, it's actually uh it's actually n- like wasted energy. You're not making new energy to mine Bitcoin. You're just using your recycling energy. Recycling, yeah. To bring it right back into Bitcoin. So listen, I, I know five six years ago, Bitcoin had this big knock for that because mines required a bunch of electricity and were burning a bunch of carbon and all that. That's no longer the case. People with solar panels are doing mining. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going that on. That explains the whole like search for a lot of them now. Yeah, man, and, and, and well, there's a lot. The reason I talk about the money go burr, right? Because that in, in the Bitcoin world, that's what we talk about. You know, the Fed make the money go burr, like right? they just print the money <laughs> every day. The problem with that is, is that you catch me a year ago when COVID started, and I would say, "Hey, the people need this money." Yeah. You catch me now, and I understand what's happening because the people are not even receiving the money that they're supposed to be getting. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't want to do all the math here because I don't have it in front of me. But if you were to break down that stimulus package per U.S. citizen. Everybody should be getting $14,000 checks. About. This is rounding it off. What did everybody get? $1,200 checks. You say $14,000? $14,000 checks. If you were to break down the stimulus package... That stimmy would have been nice. That, <laughs> right? But as you can see, where's the rest of that money going? Yeah. They're doing other stuff with it. This is not the podcast nor the conversation for that. But w- when you do money go burr, another thing happens. Inflation happens. Yeah. And when I was a kid, I used to be able to walk in and get a Big Mac for two ninety nine. The meal. Mm-hmm. How much is the Big Mac meal right now? And how much was it Eight. before? Two ninety nine. Three two bucks. Nine. Damn. I even got a buddy who found an old like you know when you wrap bases and stuff like that. You use newspaper. He found an old newspaper around the base that had like a ninety nine cent Big Mac deal. <laughs> you go now. Yo. It's eight ninety nine to get the meal. 
and they're giving you half the amount of fries. Really? That's inflation. So when I was 24, then the reason I brought it up is I didn't realize that all that does when they do burr is they make my life more expensive. And since we're minorities and we only work nine to five for the most part, and so did our parents, mm -hmm. we don't have enough money to keep up with the burr. The rich people do because they don't pay taxes and yeah. they know how to loophole the system. Your mom, my mom, your dad, my dad, they busted their ass because they could only afford enough to live because they kept doing burr. So what happens when COVID hits? They do the burr ultra. They turn this machine on, on, on. They've already cut three stimulus checks. And the problem that I'm trying to explain to minorities is this. It's a, it's, it may give us immediate satisfaction because, like you said, those stimmies are nice and we could buy new gear and we could do all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But they make it harder for us to live in the long run because the rich people don't take the tab. We do. The minorities do. Yeah. So it's going to be hard for us to live because this camera lens may be $300 today and a year or two from now is going to cost you $650. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And that's not that's what they don't tell us minorities, and that's what they don't tell us when we're young. On the meanwhile, the rich people know one thing. If I store my money in assets, the price goes up. When the Fed goes burr, asset prices go up, and now I'm more valuable without even trying. So wealthy people make money while they sleep. Us middle-class people spend money as fast as we get it. Mm -hmm. We just move it. It's just been trained to us. The boots, the example I gave earlier, boom, money, go. Mm -hmm. Wealthy people, and this is not a racism thing. This is a wealthy, this is a classism thing. Wealthy people know that if they put their money in a rare expensive painting, an art. Yeah. Jay-Z has told us this in many bars. You turn a two to a four to an eight. You buy that painting for two. You wait. You hold on to it. It goes to four. It goes to eight million. Then you give it to your kids. And they got a painting that's worth eight million. I don't know about you, because you're a very mature 24-year-old. They never taught me none of that. Yeah. None of that. And I'm learning that stuff now. I say all that, and I know it sounds like a long tangent. Bitcoin is your generation, my generation. I'm, I'm on the brink, but definitely your generation's storage of value. When you put money in Bitcoin, you buy the Mona Lisa. When you put money in Bitcoin, you buy little pieces of Manhattan before it was Manhattan. And if you just hold on to this Bitcoin, there's only ever 21 million Bitcoin. There's no more. If you just hold on to this Bitcoin, you're making money while you sleep. Your asset is getting more and more and more. And the reason the other cryptocurrencies don't work and the reason Dogecoin is a joke is because they are like fiat, like the dollar. Yep. You, you could burr Dogecoin. You could keep making Dogecoin. There's Can many you? of them. Bitcoin, there's only ever 21 million. Do you think that'll change with time? It can't because it's, programmatic. it's a peer-to-peer -peer network and it's programmatically set to only do that. So in order for somebody to change the consensus, you would have to take over 51% of the nodes on the network. Mm. I'm a node owner in my own house. Cool. There's nodes everywhere. You would have to get 51% of the system, put a new blockchain in, and expect nobody to notice. It won't happen. Mm. So Bitcoin will never change because the people decide that it never changes. It's the ultimate market decides everything tool. That's cool. But for us, is what, what it was. to uh, What our parents had gold, we have Bitcoin. Mm. Our parents were able to buy gold and store their wealth, right? They, they were able to, like, be rich without being rich. Their bank account may have had, like, 100 bucks, but they had this much amount in gold, so they were wealthy, right? Yeah. All the way back to the pyramids, gold, right? It was the thing to have. Bitcoin is this generation's because it does gold better than gold. So I could send you Bitcoin right now in a matter of seconds. Try sending the gold bar to somebody in Florida. <laughs> You're going to need security. You're going to need shipping fees. You're going to need... Imagine sending it to the other side of the world. Yeah. But why, now if I tell you that I give you this digital gold that you can send to China in a matter of 30 seconds. That's sick. It's valuable. Now what if I tell you that they're only ever going to be 21 million of them and nobody could ever nah, be No, it definitely sets the stakes up. <laughs> it's a store of value. So they never taught me what store of value is. So I'm big on Bitcoin because of this. Because as a minority, as somebody who doesn't know the monopoly rules is what I call them, the fiat games rule, I learned one thing. Buy rare assets and hold on to them for a long time. You could be familiar with the, the, um, the Charizard Pokemon card. Yep. If you have a rare holographic Charizard Pokemon card right now, and this gem mid-10, you might have got it for like five bucks in a pack when you were a kid. That shit is probably worth 10 grand right now. Wow. That's a storage of value. You're putting your money away. And then I'm, I'm going down this tangent. But when you start realizing that money and value is only time and energy, like that's what it equals out to, 
you realize that you have to have find a place to stash your time and energy because I'm getting older. But if I could put my money away, my time and energy, and I could put it in a value that goes up, when I'm ready to cash it out, I'm going to unleash all that energy that I have stored up, but I'll be wiser, I'll be smarter, I'll be older. And that's what wealthy people do. They put themselves in positions where they have assets, where they make money where they sleep, and then they unleash this money on whatever business, whatever it is that they want to do creative. That was a long tangent. I'm sorry, but I... No, am... that's, I I'm really interested in this stuff because yeah. I, I think it's... For, it's the future. I think it's that I've, I've noticed that with like the way technology, like I've, I've owned a camera when I, I was like 2015. And then when I bought the camera mm -hmm. um, within the like months, I think it was like, oh, there was a new version, you know, the new version. <laughs> so I've seen this just development of just in general, just technology. And obviously there's other things in technology that will affect yeah. other components of what it is in the world. And like we've developed so quick, I think from where we were, I used yeah. to use like a dial up speed. The I'm fact that you. I was like doing that for me, it's crazy because like I feel like I'm younger, and for me that just like blew my mind. But I saw that the progress, you know, of that right. even uh, that must. Did you have internet when you were like first like I were came, a kid? I came on to the internet when it was through the phone, and it was AOL. A yeah, so yeah, yeah. same here. So that's yeah. just wild because we both went that at the same time. Yeah, but we were different ages. Different ages. Right? So like I think that's the cool. That's the cool part is like we've seen such a fast development of technology, right? Yeah, it's almost yeah. like hard to keep up. At no, some and, and it makes sense to why you're so mature because you got exposure to that stuff early, right? Like you were, like you said, different age, but still were able to get on at the same time. As Somebody me. was joking about the um the different generations and their like sort of technology. Like you have Gen Z and yeah. like they were they got phone mid age, but now they're talking about the iPad babies, and I was dying because that's what it's. <laughs> and they were like aggressive. They were like iPad babies. <laughs> like, <laughs> Absolutely, and and it go and it's their time to do that. And I'm on the bridge, right? Like I'm already almost past my point, but I've always been to technology. So I stick around. But what's happening with this Bitcoin thing and with this blockchain thing is what the printing press did. Uh, um, in the 1600s, the church, the Catholic church was the government, right? They yeah. ran everything. They were the powerhouse. And it would literally be to the point, dude, where in order to have sex with your wife, the, 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 the chancellor, the pope would have to personally come to your house and give you guys the thumbs up. Like, yo, you're good, buddy. You good. You or no, no, you're not good. You're not. This is how it was. They were the everything. They were the government, right? And then I don't I don't know who the exact person or entity is. The printing press came around. And what the printing press allowed was is for us to be able to make books and be able to write stuff down at, at, at a, a numerous pace. So now you could write a you know how you feel. I could write how I feel. The church didn't want this. Because obviously, if you can write a book about how everything that they're teaching you is bullshit. And you could print 3,000 copies of that, you're a threat to the church because they it's a conflict, right? Yeah. So they tried to get rid of it. Obviously, they failed, and the rest is history. The church. Oh, yeah, they said they used to hide a lot of books, like Listen, Fahrenheit 451, right? Book burners. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? The church was the original book burner. So what 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 blockchain technology is doing is is it's stopping the book burners because it's given us trustless exchange. Remember how I told you that you can send this digital gold to the other side of the world? Yeah. Well, the beautiful part about that digital gold is, is that I don't need to know anything about the person who's receiving it. I don't need to know their name, their social, their face, they live, their bank account number, their routing account number. I don't need to know nothing but the address of their wallet. And that is also a hash, right? So it's like a long digit, 26 words, numbers, numerical thing, right? So that, that's the other value to it. And what's happening is with COVID and when the bird, the printer go per with, 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 the, uh, with the Fed, more people like me, and the reason I'm so passionate about this is because, once again, us minorities are not in the game where we learn these things. Yep. We're the ones that are told to be firefighters and police officers. We're not told to be entrepreneurs. That was me, engineer-focused. You see what I'm saying? So it's just one of those things where we're told to just work. We're not told to build and create things. And, and, and Bitcoin has, has, you know, it's like the Matrix, man. It's like everything doesn't make sense anymore once you go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Because you start noticing all the foul play. Mm -hmm. And you start noticing that your people, although they directly may have not faced racism, they have because the system is rooted in certain things like that. Right? And, and, and Bitcoin exposes all of that. And, and I know there's a funny thing that goes around the internet now where it's like, um, Bitcoin solves everything. Big, it doesn't solve everything. But the big problems that are happening right now are in the monetary financial system. That's the difference. That's the wealth class. That's yeah. why Save the Bridge can't make a million dollars. It's that difference. And Bitcoin is coming to eat the lunch of that system. It's coming to do it better than them, safer than them, smarter than them, and trustlessly. So I don't need to rely on the Fed to print more money, which makes my dollar less in value. Imagine this. 
You work 35 years of your life to get a 401k. You put money away in your 401k. You put it in the stock market because that's what the 401k does. When you go cash out, let's just say it's for easy math, you got $60,000. Well, what they didn't tell you is because they in D.C. decided to burr, they melted your $60,000 to $20,000 because although it says 60, as we talked about with the Big Mac, mm-hmm. the buying power went down. Yeah. So you worked 60 years for their system, for everything, for a job that you probably hated. They made dumb decisions to melt your life savings away. What does one do? Right. You feel hopeless. You have no idea. Bitcoin saves that. Because now you're able to store your value in hard as fuck money, meaning that it's unmutable. The government can't take it from you. You can leave to another place in the world and all you need is a cell phone connection and the blockchain, and you're good. Your money's there. Your currency's there. Um, I, I, and I'm going on this tangent about it. Um, I had uh, a CTO of, of a Bitcoin company called Swan Bitcoin. Shout out to Swan Bitcoin. They're fantastic. Uh, he was on another show that I do, and uh, his family's from Russia. Yep. And he was like, look, man, I wish they knew about Bitcoin. Like, when the, when the war started popping off, El Salvador, I'm sure there was wars. He was like, in Russia, he was like, when the war started popping off, my parents were forced to leave. My, poor, my parents were forced to flee. But what happened when they fled, they couldn't take anything. They lost it all. They, everything they worked for, uh, um, their parents' business, it all got left behind or whatever. Damn. If you had Bitcoin, you couldn't lose it. You would just come to the States. You would recover your wealth. You would recover your wallet because it's digital gold. And now they can't take it away from you. It's unmutable, unfuckable money. As minorities, and I know you're a young guy and I'm going on a rent. Can you buy a house on Bitcoin? Uh, yes. And if you can't and you can't directly because I'm sure the people are gonna be like, oh, the bank can't take Bitcoin. But you could convert Bitcoin into okay. USD into cash. And what's really happening that's really cool right now is you never have to get rid of your Bitcoin because Bitcoin is an asset and you can use it as collateral. So if I have one Bitcoin before this conversation was worth, I think, fifty nine thousand dollars, right? That's one Bitcoin. By the way, you can buy pieces of the Bitcoin. So I want to tell people that that are listening that don't know that already. Oh, you can. You could buy up to a dollar's worth. They're Satoshis. Damn. We can have this conversation off the mic if you want. Because yeah. <laughs> I know people are like, oh, I hear Jose talk about that all the time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's another thing. You could like, I literally, like this morning, my wife went to the store and she had like three or four dollars in change. And I was like, oh, just buy, buy four dollars in Satoshis. That's fine. So a hundred million Satoshis equal one Bitcoin. Mm, so gotcha. you could buy Satoshis and then add up to a hundred million, you can get a Bitcoin. But what I was going to say is what the asset thing is, is if a coin is worth $56,000 or 59, whatever, and you have one, you can go into a bank nowadays, a crypto bank, and basically say, hey, you can't have my Bitcoin, but I want to use my Bitcoin as a collateral for you to give me a loan. And then you could just get a USD dollar loan and never give up your Bitcoin, never give up the asset as a collateral. You have to pay back the loan. Mm-hmm. But it's a way for you to get the worth of your Bitcoin without having to give up your Bitcoin. Because remember, you want to hold on to this as long as you can yeah. for your kids, for whatever, because this is New York before it's New York. If you own Bitcoin, you own Times Square before it turned into Times Square. Hold on to that. But they never teach us that because what do they teach us? Yo, get this and move it. Yeah. I got buddies that I gave Bitcoin to, like gifted Bitcoin to. Like, yo, here's 25 bucks, happy birthday, whatever it may be. Here's some Bitcoin. I talked to them a few weeks later. Yo, what's up with the Bitcoin? It's, good. it's doing good, huh? You caught that money. Oh, yeah, listen, I went out with my lady and I cashed out that Bitcoin. And, just... and I, I, I understand them because of how we grew up. It was like, yo, I'm not going to wait around for this money to turn into whatever. But if anybody, you know, and it's, if I'm worth anything and anybody gets any information from me, it's, you need to be able to get this storage of value, put your money away in it, and just have like a long delayed gratification. Like be able to forget about it, be able to let it do its thing, yeah. and hold on to this forever, technically. Uh, because remember, if this is land, if this is gold, if this is the Mona Lisa, there's only ever 21 million of this. You want to be the guy that has this. And if you're not the guy that has this, and you see the US dollar, the fiat burning and going down to the ground, jump off of that ship. The dollar dies. And I think, I, I, I quote this all the time, but I think I could be getting it wrong. I, I, in the Bitcoin standard, the book, they give the example where it's like, in the history of human empires, fiat currency, which is what we do, money, fiat currency has been tried 100 times, and 100 times it has failed. There's never been a successful use of the fiat currency. And we're headed there now. And we're headed there faster because of the stimulus, because they're, burr, they're just making money up. Yeah. Listen, Fernando, the, the problem is this. Like, when, when, when we switched to the gold standard, our money was backed by gold. Now it's not backed by anything. It's backed by the military. Mm-hmm. And what happens with that is, is that you build a house of cards, and you're only as good as your military at that point. 
So our U.S. dollar is globally supreme and used and, you know, transacted across the world because we have the strongest military in the world. And we tell the world that they have to use the U.S. dollar. Yeah, I'm going out, I'm going out Salvador soon and they use, like, the USD. They actually what? use the USD there. The dollar? Yeah. Yeah, what's their currency like? Their native currency, or do they have any? They don't that's, have any. They that's got wiped out. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I like to hear about the the, the like. Uh, I know it's not near there for say, but uh, Venezuela. Have you heard of what's happening happening in Venezuela? Oh yeah, I've I've mean, personally seen like a lot of Venezuelans have to come up to like Worcester just looking for jobs. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's some. There's people going hungry on yeah. this situation, like so, out of jobs. So Venezuela is a small example of what can happen to the United States. What Venezuela's government did is 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 debase their currency. So the Venezuelan peso eventually became worthless because they kept printing more of it. They kept inflating it. And then I, 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 this is video that always rings in my head. There was Venezuelans literally getting shovels of Venezuela pesos and throwing them in the street because it was worthless money. And there's another picture that I think about that shows like a chicken, like a roasted chicken. And there's three stacks of bills behind it. And they don't even take dollars. They weigh the currency now. Like you need to bring me three pounds of pesos for me to give you this chicken. Because they debase the currency. The currency is dead. It doesn't exist. So what solves it? Bitcoin does. And then now those small companies, uh, countries like Venezuela, um, uh, Argentina is one of them. Um, Ecuador is another one. They're starting to use the Bitcoin network to transact because they can't trust their own dollars getting they debased. Can't, yeah. Right. Well, that's because if Venezuela would have known, let's say they were doing Bitcoin. Yeah. They would have been fine in this situation. They would have not been fine, but they, they, a lot of the people that lost their wealth there would have had an escape vessel to yeah. not lose their wealth, right? And that's what happened because when you trust in the U.S. dollar. So a lot of us were taught to, like I said, either take it in and waste it or save it in the bank account. The best note, you know, put it in the bank account, save it for a rainy day, they tell us. What happens with the rainy day fund is, is you're not making any money back on that. The bank is not giving you any interest on that, although they're making interest on that. So what happened is, is, Imagine you, you know, you were in Venezuela and you put all your business money into the bank because they told you that that's the safest place. You don't want it under the mattress. They'll steal it from you yeah. or your house will burn down or mm -hmm. something like that. So they tell you, you put it in the bank. So one day you go to the bank and the bank is like, yo, we owe money to the government. And the government said, we need to drop your account by 10%. This happened, by the way. And they were like, well, you can't do that. And they were like, well, yes, we can. And they dropped everybody's account. This didn't happen in Venezuela. This happened in, in, in Cyprus, which is in Italy, I believe, yeah. uh, in 2009, which is the birth of Bitcoin. So everybody woke up that morning to 10% less in their bank account. And they couldn't do anything about that. So what I mean by Bitcoin solves this, it solves it in a lot of 10 ways. 10% can get up. That can. And the it. example that I heard in, in Sicily, there was a lady who said, yeah, my life, my parents put down 60K and we walked away with something close to 20K. And they just woke up to that. They couldn't do anything about that. So what Bitcoin allows, to do, allows you to do is be sovereign in, in, in your wealth. So that can never happen because you own your coins. There's this thing in Bitcoin called um, uh, your keys, right? Your private keys. Mm -hmm. And, and they're words. They're 24 words that are the key to your vault, to your Bitcoin. So there's something called own your keys. Or, or If you don't own your keys, you don't own the cheese. So a lot of people buy Bitcoin through Cash App and through places like that, but they leave it on Cash App. And what Cash App does oh, is damn. they keep the key, so they own the Bitcoin, technically. So what, what provider do you have to use? Well, you have to get a hardware wallet. And once again, we could talk about it after the yeah, show. Yeah. But uh, um, basically, you send your money to cold storage, which is your personal you know, vault. And then, once again, you can flee the country. You can be in Ecuador. You can be in Venezuela. And when the currency locally starts to die, your storage of wealth doesn't melt with it because your Bitcoin continues to rise in value. So while all these people are losing their life savings because they trusted the banks or they trusted the Fed and the Fed started doing crazy shit, you have unfuckable money put away. And I don't even think about it as money anymore. I think about it as gold. I really do. Because I've gotten to the point where I pay my bills. I obviously pay for stuff that I buy and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, fiat dollars dying. I don't, I, I don't need to hold any more than I need to hold. So... As when we get off of this, we could talk about it. I, I, I highly encourage people to keep very minimal in their bank and invest a lot of the other ones. Not in stocks, but in hard assets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, paintings, rare art. If you believe in an artist nowadays, like, um, I keep bringing her her up, but just shout out to Jasmine. Uh, and by, right behind me, I have Mr. Boom stuff. He's from Worcester as well. Shout out to, to, to Mo and Mr. Boom and all that stuff he got going on. But my point is this, is I bought this from him because I believe in him. That's an asset that if he continues to climb and continue to do incredible stuff, if he becomes the next Leonardo da Vinci, right? If he becomes whatever, any artist that you love, yeah. 
That's not going to go up in value. That shows a lot of appreciation. The artists, imagine how they feel about that too. I'm buying from all artists it's like, that I know. I, I think ev- giving some artists the feel that feeling of like they're going to look at that, va- it's value. It's an asset. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an asset. And it's unfuckable money. I mean, my house could burn down, right? And that's why I could lose that or whatever. But that's why, you know, you need unfuckable money, which is Bitcoin. You can't lose your Bitcoin, even if your house burns down. But you also have to diversify. So once again, I made an investment on a buddy of mine that I think does incredible work and that I believe in. Mm-hmm. If he blow, if he doesn't do anything with his life, it's cool. I still like him. I think they dope. But if you believe in your, you know, your counter peers, if you believe in the artists that you work with, buy their stuff and show it off. Totally. Be- because it, NFTs, right? Because if they go kaboom, you your stuff that you bought from them for cheap goes kaboom, and it feels good for the soul, as you yeah, know. It's to- the soul that you're paying the price to. Like, it's a win across the board. They get is. paid so they can put food on the table initially. They get, you know, motivation. They get, I, they, they continue to climb up. You get investment wealth, but you both get paid in the soul creatively for them and for you for supporting. I'm a big supporter. I talked to Mo. I bought that immediately. Jasmine, she didn't tell me during the conversation, but afterwards, we're, me and my wife are working on, on, on a piece with Jasmine to be able to have in our living room upstairs or whatever. Uh, and any artist that I bump into, I obviously have to like it. Yeah. You know, you know, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you don't like it, you don't want to be that nice or whatever. But I try to support in those small ways because to me, that's where the real assets, that's where the real value lies, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I do this stuff for assets. I, I I'm an author. I write books. I just self-published a book. I do that for assets, meaning that this podcast for you and I may not mean nothing for either one of us now, but it's an asset that lives forever. Totally. And when you blow up or I blow up, they'll always be able to come back and be like, yo, let's check out that conversation that they had. And it's an asset that lives forever. So Yo, you, that just made this really cool. Yeah, so you I and believe that, in that. Like when I do video, man, I, like it's, it's such a nostalgic asset. piece too. Yes. Seeing how you have grown, seeing how you kind of just like, yes, sir. it's growth. You're witnessing growth and it's like, it's lived in the past, so it's timeless, you know? It's an asset building. Yeah. Uh, in video, my brother-in-law who, who does weddings and stuff that I, I shout out to him. Uh, he um, always reminded me of this. He was like, Yo, because we would be at weddings or whatever. And he was like, how much does it cost a bride? How much would a bride pay to see the last video of her grandma dancing with her before she passed away? Price, priceless. She would, she would pay whatever to get that video. She would. Because it's an asset. Yeah. It's something that it's scarce, it's non-replaceable, and it builds value over time. Value doesn't always have to mean cash. Value is sentimental. Value is a lot of different things. And I'm really big on that, man. So I support my artists in that sense because I believe in people. I believe in creativity. You just deposited in this conversation, our and some change that we're going on right now, you just deposited value into this asset. And so did I. We both got a multi-vault. It's a vault together. You put some value. I put some value. And hopefully, when we drop this this week or next week, we get value out of it. But the point is, is that you and I have a long way to go, right? And we're going up. We do. Right? Yeah, right here, real quick. Cool, man. Let's do it. Yeah. That's... I. I... Definitely. You and I have awesome. a ways to go. How how much more valuable is this podcast going to be when you and I reach our destination? Totally. That's it, what we got to do shit. as artists. That, that's what we got to do as creators, man. So let's what, tell the people where they can find you. Tell the people, you know, what you're excited about here in Worcester. And, 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 and let's close these guys out for a little bit. Totally. Yeah. Um, I just wanted one big thing. It's just... Yeah, um, please. So to support the bridge, they're continuing to raise some money and... They they have goals to just keep pushing, you know. I think the biggest thing is to show show up. I call it, you know. Um, so on the, if you go to their Instagram page, it's at Save the Bridge, five oh eight, and you can find their on their link there. There's a, a it's a givebutter dot com slash Save the Bridge. Yep. So going to that website, Give Butter, um, it has all the information about the bridge. It has where you can donate and how you can help because they're looking for volunteers continuously. And I think if we show up it'll something could happen and right now i've just been filming a lot of that story because i think it's powerful stuff and like you're saying it's an asset you know it's like yeah. this will live on for everyone whether or not the like the bridge is going to be saved which we don't like to say that because you know it's like something that this is going to change the way the community works Absolutely. you know yep. so if we can like capture this like yeah. let's this is going to be beautiful yeah in the end you know absolutely yeah so we're just i've just been we're focusing a lot on there and so yeah just follow save the bridge 508 and um you can catch me on my i have instagram too it's fern ponce p-o-n-c-e yeah so yeah yeah yeah. no i'm gonna put all those links in the description for sure listen fernando i did i always tell my guests that you know sometimes the 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 podcast host has to like gaslight people like oh i'm not gaslighting you i appreciate (laughs) you very much yeah I, i think for what 
your age and how far you've been able to travel, what you've been able to capture, what you've been able to do, what you understand at your age is a huge tool going forward. I'm super excited for to be able to connect with you, to be able to do this, to be able to do more things with you and just follow your journey, man. Because once again, my job is to have a conversation with the most interesting people around. And, and this one hits another home run. You're, you're super interesting. You're super motivating. You got me pumped up, ready to go. Please keep going, man. And hopefully we can do another one of these in the future. Thank you. Cool, man. Awesome. Guys, I put those links down there for you guys to be able to check out. Check out Fernando's work. It's awesome. It's incredible work. Uh, and his last name is my hometown. How could I hate on that? It's a beautiful Ponce. <laughs> Shout out to Ponce. Shout out to everybody in Puerto Rico. Shout out to everybody in El Salvador. Shout out to everybody that's listening. I appreciate your love. I'll talk to you guys next time. Take care. Thanks for joining me for another great conversation, guys. I love all the guests that I've had on lately because they're all so selfless and they all act for the community first. And that's more of what we need and more of what I need in my life. I appreciate Fernando and everybody like him, especially from the town of Worcester. As always, guys, please rate, share, and subscribe so I can continue to have the conversations I love to have and you can continue to have the conversations you love to listen to. As always, take care, guys. Later.